Okay, so um, I'm going to mute everybody, um, but if if you have a part, um, I will. If you have a part, I will either unmute you or you can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, welcome. Um, we, as we have done in the last couple of um, weeks, we will be um, putting an upload of this um, service to um, the Facebook page and to YouTube. Um, but uh, apart from the beginning, um, it will just be whoever's speaking. Um, so I will hand over to Nigel. All right. So good morning, everybody. Um, it's uh, am I? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. You can just nod. That's great. Okay. So so uh, I'm Nigel Pope. I'm a member of the congregation here at Saint Augustine's with St Luke's, and it's just so great to see you, um, or see you all, or hear you all. Um, I think we've got about so we've got a total of 58, 58 participants on the call. So um, and of, of which there's about ten people on the phone, and the rest coming in by screen and internet. I hope you've all had a good week in the circumstances. Uh, hopefully most of you will have seen our weekly good news email. Um, but if there's anything you need, uh, please contact Steve, our vicar, or Helen, our youth minister. And if there's anything you'd like to pray for, contact Liz, Car Liz Carter, there's a link on the email. Or more generally, if you can't remember what I just said, uh, contact Steve. Um, and if you'd like to follow the service on a service sheet, it is attached to the good news email. And hopefully um, uh, a lot of you will be able to stay on at the end when we're going to break out for virtual coffee or tea or whatever you want, really, into, into breakout rooms. And uh, Zoom uh, chooses who you end up in a room with. So uh, it's a potluck and uh, maybe you'll get to meet one or two new people. So before we start the service, uh, let me tell you about one of, one of the highlights of my week. Um, I had my very first home haircut. Um, we've purchased some hair clippers and my daughter-in-law, Rachel, did the honours. And for those of you who are on the phone, it's, not, it's a number one. So uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, very, it's very smart and aerodynamic. So, and today you may be able to see, if you're on the phone, you won't, but I'm wearing a shirt made for me in Condoa. In, in Tanzania and it was made rather too tight uh, but a combination uh, of all the running I've been able to do on our treadmill and lots of good healthy home cooking um, is now enabling me to fit into it so I thought I'd wear it this morning to uh, uh, well so you can you can see some of that that uh, high quality Kondoa Tanzania tailoring so the theme of our service today uh, is, is, uh, is the road to Emmaus, where Jesus met two of his followers, but they didn't recognise him initially. We're going to have Helen. Helen's going to give us a children's talk. Sheila will be preaching. Uh, Rob Hutchings will be leading our prayers. Colin Sampson will be reading for us. And we have two lovely hymns with music from Juliet and David and Chris Case. So thank you to all of you uh, for your preparation for this service. So now we move into our service and we start with a time of silence as we prepare our hearts and our minds. God, we gather as your people. We come to walk a journey together. 
to talk and to share along the way, to meet and to know Jesus. Help us to marvel at all that Jesus has done for us. Amen. And now some words of praise and thanksgiving. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Alleluia. Those who believe in him shall never die. Alleluia. Blessed are you, sovereign Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To you be glory and praise forever. You raised your son to life in triumph. Through him, death has been destroyed and radiant life is everywhere restored. As you call us out of darkness into his marvellous light, may our lives reflect his glory and our lips repeat the endless song. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And now we're going to sing one of my very favourite songs uh, from Graham Kedrick, All Heaven Declares. So now uh, we're going to move on to uh, um, to have a reading from uh, which Colin is, is going to bring, bring for us. So Colin, over to you. Thank you. This morning's reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Later that Sunday, two of Jesus' disciples were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a journey of about 17 miles. They were in the midst of a discussion about all the events of the last few days when Jesus walked up and accompanied them in their journey. They were unaware that it was Jesus walking alongside them, for God prevented them from recognising him. Jesus said to them, 
You seem to be in a deep discussion about something. What are you talking about? So sad and gloomy. They stopped. And the one named Cleopas answered, Haven't you heard? Are you the only one in Jerusalem unaware of the things that happened over the last few days? Jesus asked, What things? The things about Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they replied. He was a mighty prophet of God who performed miracles and wonders. His words were powerful and he had great favour with God and the people. But three days ago, the high priest and the rulers of the people sentenced him to death and had him crucified. We all hoped that he was the one who would redeem and rescue Israel. Early this morning, some of the women informed us of something amazing. They said they went to the tomb and found it empty. They claimed two angels appeared and told them that Jesus is now alive. Some of us went to see for ourselves and found the tomb exactly like the women said, but no one has seen him. Jesus said to them, why are you so thick headed? Why do you find it so hard to believe every word the prophets have spoken? Wasn't it necessary for Christ, the Messiah, to experience all these sufferings and then afterward to enter his glory? Then he carefully unveiled to them the revelation of himself through the scripture. He started from the beginning and explained the writings of Moses and all the prophets, showing how they wrote of him and revealed the truth about himself. As they approached the village, Jesus walked on ahead, telling them he was going to a distant place. They urged him to remain there and pleaded, stay with us, it will be dark soon. So Jesus went with them into the village. Joining them at the table for supper, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. All at once their eyes were opened and they realized it was Jesus. Then suddenly, in a flash, Jesus vanished from before their very eyes. Stunned, they looked at each other and said, why didn't we recognize it was him? Didn't our hearts burn with the flames of holy passion while she walked beside him? He unveiled for us such profound revelation from the scriptures. They left at once and hurried back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. When they found the eleven and the other disciples all together, they overheard them saying, It's really true. The Lord has risen from the dead. He even appeared to Peter. Then the two disciples told the others what had happened to them on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus had unveiled himself as he broke bread with them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Colin, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was really good. Thank you. So uh, now uh, we're going to hand over to Helen, who's going to give a children's talk. Okay. So I thought that we'd have a little challenge. Okay. You're in your house and there are lots and lots of things in your house. Um, so you have 20 seconds to find three objects. They can be any objects that you uh, that you want. Um, and this is not just an activity for the children. I can see if you're joining in. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to count down and I want you, um, yeah, you've got 20, 20 seconds to find three items, any three items that you can um, go. I can see a lot of you are just looking at me going, no. Find three items. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Stop. Okay. I have to stop. How do I stop the count? Okay. So you've got your three items. I've got an orange, uh, a ball of wool and a phone okay what i would like you to do is i would like you to see how many of those three items you can balance on your head hmm i know it's more difficult isn't it so let's see if we can do it i can see that you're all doing it having a go oh les is there i can see that oh got oh, oh well done the allens have uh, have have ma managed it Oh, I don't know if I can get the phone in there as well. Maybe I should have put the phone first. Hmm. Almost. Okay. Now, 
there was a reason for it. Well done, give yourself a round of applause. Okay. There was a reason for that. Now, does anybody know what this is? I'm a, I bet my dad is very pleased that I'm able to find my spirit level. Okay. A spirit level is a very helpful tool. And we all need balance in our lives. A level um, it contains this very this weird bit of liquid. I've got no idea what the liquid is, but it has a bubble in the middle. And when the bubble is in the middle of those two lines, the level it's at level with gravity. And the level is perfectly balanced. I wonder if you've ever helped your mum or your dad put up a shelf, or maybe you've put up a shelf using one of these. Our phones have one too, but it's a bit com more complicated. If the shelf isn't balanced properly, the things fall off. And depending on what you've got on your shelf, it can cause an awful mess. And it's a great thing to, to think about in life. It's a great reminder that we all need balance in our lives, especially at the moment. In Ecclesiastes in the Bible, Solomon talks about how there is a time and a season for everything. And right now, it can be quite difficult to get a balance. There are lots of things that we want to do more than others. Maybe we want to spend more time playing with our Lego or playing on the computer games than we do doing our maths or doing writing up the meetings from from a minute um, the minutes from a meeting but there's a time to play and a time to do schoolwork a time to be with family a time to spend with god and a time to rest and as you as we go on in this time there'll be lots and lots of things to balance like those out items that we balanced on our heads and it can be really challenging to make sure that they all balance. So how do we balance? We know that the level is balanced when the bubble is in the middle and it can take work to get it into the middle. And just like the bubble, we can keep our lives balanced when God is at the center of our lives. When we put God first, God gives us the wisdom to know how to keep the balance. Not instantly, maybe. Maybe it takes time, it takes work. But you'll learn to make the stuff, time for the stuff that you have to do, like homework and housework and jobs, and the stuff you want to do, like playing and having fun, and the stuff you need to do, like spending time with family, washing, spending time with God. And when God falls away from the center, things that we, that things get out of balance very quickly. But when we keep God at the center, we'll find that we have more than enough time to do the important things in life. So maybe today, this week, you need to think about what you're balancing and how, um, yeah, think about what you're balancing and ask God to help you balance that more. Nigel, I'll hand over to you. Alan, thank you. Um, you're right, in, this, in these strange circumstances, finding balance is, is, I think, a challenge for all of us. So thank you for that. So now we're going to hand over to, um, to oh no, we're not. <clears throat> right. So um, we're now going to move into a, a time of confession uh, of our sins. So we're just going to start with a, a short period of silence. Risen Lord, we are sorry that we fail to recognize you in our midst, that we are too preoccupied with ourselves. We are sorry that we let you down, that we feast and don't invite others to share with us. We're sorry that we welcome friends, 
but not always the stranger or anyone who makes us feel uncomfortable. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be generous people. Our church, our homes and our hearts, make them always places of welcome. Amen. And now we pray together the prayer of the day, the collect. So all together, risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. So Sheila, I'm going to hand over to you now to take us down the road to Emmaus. Great. Good morning, everybody. So I wonder about... Um, I've just come to the... <laughs> I've just come to the end of a series which one review effusively described as a near-perfect, smart, suspenseful and superbly shot crime thriller with a surprisingly sharp sense of humour. Well, that sounds amazing, doesn't it? So I watched and I would agree with that review right up until the last episode. For seven episodes, the pace was taut and the characters were complex and engaging and I was engrossed. But in episode eight, it was like the writer's brains had melted from the effort of the previous weeks and the show just unraveled. Out of the blue, they threw in a very ill-judged and very poorly executed dance sequence that went on for what felt like forever. All in all, it was a very, very unsatisfactory conclusion. And just like that, the entire series was ruined for me. I struggled to make sense of it, wondering why I'd spent eight perfectly good hours of my life on something that had come to nothing. In our reading, we find two people reeling from a baffling ending, but in their case, the stakes were much, much higher. We find them beyond disappointment. In fact, these two are devastated. The rabbi that they'd been following, the one they hoped would redeem and rescue Israel, had instead been declared a criminal and crucified. Hopes crushed, they were on their way home to Emmaus. And that's understandable. In times of pain and sorrow, it's human nature to want comfort, to want to lick our wounds in the safety of the familiar. Somewhere along the road home, deep in mournful discussion, they are interrupted by a fellow traveller. We know it's Jesus, but somehow they don't recognise him. You seem to be in deep discussion, Jesus says. What's got you so glum? Now he doesn't ask the question because he needed the answer. He knew he'd experienced it all firsthand. He could have unveiled their eyes instantly, dramatically revealing himself as their glorious risen Lord. Instead, he continues in feigned ignorance, patiently, lovingly walking with them, listening to them as they process their loss. If Jesus met one of us on the road, he'd be more likely to ask us something than to tell us anything. In the Gospels, he's constantly probing, questioning. It's frustrating when you want instant answers. It's also humbling. He who knows all things still wants to engage with us where we're at, and from there to draw us to where he's at. The disciples give Jesus a rough summary of his own life, which would be funny, but then it's that fragment. We had hoped he was the one that stops us from laughing out loud. That phrase encapsulates their despair as if it's clear to them that he couldn't possibly be all that they had come to expect that he would be. But we had hoped the disappointment weighs heavily upon their words. Dashed dreams blind us to hope. They block our ears to the voice of God. These two are standing next to hope embodied, but they feel no hope. 
They're standing next to true power, but they feel utterly powerless. Jesus rebukes them gently and asks yet another question. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Before they have time to wrap their heads around this idea, Jesus launches into a lesson, unpacking scriptures that point to the truth. He doesn't refer to what they have seen, nor does he refer back to the predictions he made himself about all that would happen. Instead, Jesus goes back to the Old Testament, interpreting it in the light of his story. The living word revealed through the written word. He opens their eyes to fresh perspective. And even though their hearts are burning as Jesus speaks, his, ident his identity is still a mystery to them. It's not until he comes in and has supper with them. They recognize his presence in the breaking of the bread. Now, possibly they had heard of Jesus breaking the bread in that last Passover meal with the apostles a few days ago. Or, and maybe they were recalling Jesus' words, my body broken for you. More likely, they were remembering the way Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it to miraculously feed the 5,000. In fact, back in Luke 9, just after that enormous crowd was fed, someone else recognized Jesus' identity. Peter made his declaration, You are God's Messiah. And here, as soon as these two disciples recognize Jesus, he disappears. They're left to marvel, their despair has turned to joy. They immediately get up and rush back to Jerusalem to share the good news with the disciples. Who are these two followers of Jesus? One is named and the other isn't. It's often assumed that they're both male, but the two invite Jesus to come in and stay with them, which suggests that they're a married couple. What is more, a clear passage is mentioned elsewhere in scripture. In John 19, we read, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas. So it's possible that Clopas and Cleopas are one and the same, and that the two disciples are in fact Jesus' aunt and uncle. However, maybe Luke left the second person unnamed deliberately, so that we can put ourselves in the story alongside Cleopas. I love this story because it so underscores Jesus' gentleness towards us in times of difficulty. He knows that life can be hard and he's not put off by the disciples' woundedness. He doesn't condemn their disappointment or their lack of understanding or their lapse in faith. In the middle of their confusion and their grief and their pain, Jesus draws near. Jesus journeys with us even when we abandon hope and run away. He stays near even when we don't recognize him. Take heart, friends. God is with us, even now. So what keeps us from recognizing him? Maybe the disciples failed to recognize Jesus because his appearing wasn't on their agenda. They weren't expecting to see him, so they didn't. Earlier in the chapter, we hear that the women went to the tomb and they didn't find Jesus there, but they saw angels declaring the good news that Jesus was alive. Some of the male disciples went, disparaging and disbelieving, to check for themselves, but they saw nothing. And it makes me wonder how much I've missed because my eyes have been clouded over by cynicism and unbelief. I wonder how many times God has shone his glory into my life, but I missed it because it looked more like shadows than glory. I wonder how many times God has sent blessings into my life, but I missed them because they didn't feel like blessings. Lord, help our unbelief. The Emmaus Road story challenges me to pray daily that God opens our eyes to see his presence with us. 
that when we read his word, we will know him more deeply, so that in, that in the everyday events of life, we will see him more clearly. For he is Emmanuel, he is God with us. There are many things about this season of isolation that are difficult, but it is also an opportunity. In his book, The Way of the Heart, Henry Nouwen describes solitude as a furnace for transformation. By the time the season ends, may we be changed because we have looked for and seen the resurrected Christ and dwelt deeply in his presence. I'll leave you with a poem by Malcolm Gweet, which expresses the beauty of this encounter. Emmaus One. And do you ask what I am speaking of, although you know the whole tale of my heart, its longing and its loss, its hopeless love? You walk beside me now and take my part, as though a stranger, one who doesn't know, the pit of dis disappointment, the despair, the jolts and shudders of my letting go, my aching for the one who isn't there. And yet you know my darkness from within, my cry of dereliction is your own. You bore the isolation of my sin, alone that I need never be alone. Now you reveal the meaning of my story, that I who burn with shame might blaze with glory. Amen. Sheila, thank you. Um, as you say, God is with us, but we sometimes struggle to see him. So um, thank you for those words, really helpful. So we're now going to move on to sing uh, our second song, our second hymn, which is Living Lord. So uh, now I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Rob Hutchings, who's going to lead us in our prayers. All right, Mike. 
I'm coming through. You're on, Rob. Okay. As we come to pray, let's remind ourselves of the words of St. Paul. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came into this world to save us sinners. There on the cross you died. The righteous for the unrighteous. So that those who come to put their faith in you may receive forgiveness and eternal life. In these days of trouble, we do not understand why you have allowed the virus to come upon this world, but may provide for many a call to turn to you, acknowledging our helplessness before you. For our world we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves and all connected to this church. May we be confident that you are watching over us for good. We've been asked to pray for John, a former member of this church who has the virus. Also to pray for Brian Kendall, who is very unwell and his wife, Margaret. We remember your words to the Apostle Paul in his time of distress. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we are called to proclaim your message throughout the world. Here in this district, may we not be ashamed to share our faith. Even in these days of lockdown, you may give us opportunities. And as restrictions are lifted, we may, through the church programme, and through our contact with friends and neighbours, your word may become known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church in this country and throughout the world. Not only the Anglican Church, but all denominations. May we be a worldwide community, running with perseverance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we know that in many countries, Christians are facing persecution, restriction on activities, discrimination against individuals, sometimes imprisonment, or violence by terrorist groups. We hear of teenage Christian girls being forced into marriage with Muslim men. May they all know your strengthening presence with them. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Rob. That was really good. Now we're going to move on uh, to pray 
the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray for the coming of God's kingdom in the words that our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to hand over to Steve now, who's going to give us uh, some notices and then he will be sending us out. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, it would not, of course, be a church service if we did not have any notices. Where would we be without notices? So just a, a couple of things. But first of all, I want to say a, a big thank you to the team for organising the service today. Uh, uh, everything was marvellous. The singing was fantastic. Uh, the way they did that. So well done, Chris, Juliet and David. Uh, Sheila, thank you for your words. Uh, they really, I don't know what anybody else thought, but they really just got to the heart and uh, really made one think. Yes, Dave, Dave Allen's putting his thumbs up and I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and also, Helen, thank you. The, what really came to mind was you used a spirit level. Spirit level. And that's what we need. We need to know God's presence his holy spirit resting upon us to give us that that even kill that we need today probably more more so than ever and that really that sort of uh, analogy just really spoke to me um just a a, a couple of other things to uh, uh, to say all the food uh, stuff that was given to us last week i took to the food bank and uh, i have to tell you they was going absolutely manic there cars turning up loads of food going into the food bank in one end but quite literally going out the door the other end uh, uh, there is a massive need uh, lots of people are struggling at this time um, we are very fortunate we we live in a very nice uh, area but of course there are lots of people that are struggling and very easily we can look around to see what we've got and not realize what we can see somewhat to the uh, to the people that are those that are walking on that road to Emmaus they didn't see what was before them and all too easily we can fall into that same path and uh, it's the generosity of hearts to be able to give to others that uh, has really I think brought community together and so if um, if you're at all able to the box is still outside the vicarage and uh, will continue to be there if you can put anything in it great if you need stuff to be picked up from home, then uh, I'm more than willing to come and, come and pick it up. Just give me a call. In fact, we've got a phone call already going in the background there. So you never know, it might be one of you already. A um, couple of other things. Um, first of all, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to uh, have a, a time of prayer. Uh, and we're trying to continue that every Wednesday again. We would normally, of course, have communion at St. Uh, in the chapel at St. Augustine's and that will be at 11.30 to 12. We're going to do that on Zoom. So again, for those that you just use the links that we would normally use and uh, those that uh, uh, phone in again, use the same links. A uh, couple of other things. Ah, yes. Now there are emails doing the rounds that are pretending to come from the vicar and uh, they are invariably asking for money saying for some reason i have a cousin or a family member that needs a gift uh, but i haven't got any cash on me so can you do it for me uh, sometimes it's asking for you to buy amazon vouchers uh, and there's been somebody who's bought 700 pounds worth of amazon vouchers apparently not in our congregation let me tell you now these are dodgy emails i will not ask anybody for any money if you see an email from me asking for money please delete it it is a scam okay so i need to tell you that uh, there's somehow they're taking my email and adjusting it slightly but it is false 
So please, please do not um, send any money anywhere. If you're in any doubt, phone me, talk to me. Uh, one other thing as well, um, roundabout. Roundabout is uh, continuing and uh, this week at some stage, I believe that it is going onto the website. So you'll be able to uh, read uh, bits and pieces about church life and everything else. And during this time, the team from Roundabout are going to continue to try to uh, put this together. So if you have anything you'd like to put in there from um, news of family and friends, birthdays, anniversaries, pets, antics, uh, nice walks, stunning spring shots, or what have you read? What is your favorite book at the time? Sheila, you're gonna need to tell us what that series you was watching so we don't watch it, all right? I'd hate to lose eight hours. I do that and lots of other stuff. I don't need to do it on that. Uh, but good films as well. What have you been watching? Um, I have to say, I taped a film the other day that I would recommend. Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines. Fantastic film. Um, but if you've got anything you'd like to be included in the roundabout, please do get in touch with either Adrian King or Mary Plummer. Okay, and there are others, but I'll just give those two names out at the moment. In a moment, we're going to break out into our breakout groups. But uh, first of all, Lord Jesus, as you walked on the road to Emmaus, walk with us on the roads that we travel. Help us to know your presence with us and to be your presence to others. And at the end of the day, may we all enjoy your feast. Amen. And so sisters and brothers in Christ, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Am I handing back to Nigel or Helen? I'm not quite sure. Um, so, so I'll start talking. So, so Helen is going to um, unmute us all in a moment and, uh, and then uh, randomly split us, or Zoom is going to randomly split us into, uh, into breakout rooms. So um, please, please, please do stay and chat if you can. And um, also, um, I think Helen has a, um, uh, has a notice about bits and pieces, which she's going to give just before she um, uh, puts us into breakout rooms. I am. Um, just to let you know, um, we're having a virtual bits and pieces on um, Thursday at 7.30 on Zoom. Um, more details will be, can be found on our Facebook page and on our website. Um, but don't look now because it's not quite there. Um, but yes, so 7.30 um, and it'll be on Zoom and we will be making um, these lovely macrame um, bracelets. There we go. I, I forgot the word then. Okay. I'm going to unmute you all now. So don't all shout at once. Um, and, um, there we go. You're all unmuted now. Um, <laughs> open all rooms. Right. You should be getting a notification that says um, join breakout room. Oh, yeah.